the first thing that you need is that high level tra uh, training on the process for everyone. The second is then you need to find handoffs in the detailed process because when those handoffs are clear, each team, either side of the handoff, are happy. They know what has or hasn't been done so far. And as a result, they can avoid duplicating effort or dropping balls. So look at the high level journey and then say, OK, now start, let's say, at the beginning. Let's start with what happens in marketing, what happens in sales. Remember that the journey to a stress free business and applying these sorts of things, it's a marathon not a sprint. But by taking these steps repeatedly, you can transform those potential silos into effective, collaborative units that work seamlessly together, ensuring a smoother operation and a much less stressful work environment. Welcome to De-Stress Your Business, the podcast where we show you how to get incredible results in your business without the constant stress. I'm Alexis Kingsbury, a serial entrepreneur and founder at Air Manual. Now, as a business grows, the functions within it, marketing, sales, finance, and so on, often become less connected. It may feel like they work in silos, opaque to each other and operating independently. Team members may feel unclear on what the people in other departments are doing and how handoffs should work between the teams. As a result, they duplicate work, they drop balls. Uh, and as an example, uh, the leadership team of a training business uh, that we work with uh, was finding that no one in the organization seemed to understand their end-to-end -end journey that their customers and their learners as part of their training organization um, that they would go through, that they went through. And as a result, misunderstandings were common. Some teams would collect information from, from the learners that had already been collected earlier. Other teams would assume that those learners would be given key information later, but they weren't. And this led to inefficiency, to unhappy customers and expensive mistakes. Now, the business leaders knew that they needed to fix it, but it's a complex process with many steps and lots of people involved. But how could they present the information to their teams without overwhelming them? That's what we're going to cover in this episode. First, we'll start off with why functional silos exist and whether it's even possible to completely remove them. We'll then look at what information your teams need to smooth the gaps between those uh, departments and avoid the silos. And then we'll look at how to deliver the information in a way that's not overwhelming uh, so that you can get even new team members able to, to see through and uh, overcome those issues. As a result, you'll be able to break down silos and get your teams working efficiently together without duplication or dropping balls. So let's start with whether it's possible to eliminate silos completely. Now, in the hundreds of businesses that I've worked with, uh, either uh, some of my own, but not hundreds, I've worked with many that are clients, I've seen that it always becomes necessary to group team members into departments as it grows. And that's for a variety of reasons, but particularly because a manager can typically only handle four to eight direct reports. And so it makes sense to group people together into teams and those teams within to bigger departments and so on to create that structure. Having that also allows the business to set objectives and targets at a high level that then cascade neatly uh, down to each team and uh, even individual people within it. For example, you might have an overall revenue target, which then breaks down into new sales and repeat sales. And then new sales breaks down into the number of leads and conversion rates and average order value. And as a result, marketing can have a target for the number of leads. Sales can have a target on their conversion rate and average order value and so on. Now, the most common structure and of how to organize a business is functional or sometimes called essentially sort of horizontal. So it's having marketing, sales, finance, HR, and so on. Now, having said that, large organizations that I've worked with as a consultant and so on um, will perhaps organize either geographically or by channel or other industry vertical or whatever to um, either above that or then within that. 
So for example, you might have an organization that has North and South America, then uh, EMEA, which is Europe, Middle East and Africa, and then Asia Pac, which is kind of Asia and down the Pacific and, uh, and down to Australia and so on. So they might start off with that organization of drug fee and then within that have functionals. So then the EMEA sales uh, uh, team and the EMEA marketing team and so on. Or maybe they have marketing and then within that function, they then have the geographic split. Or maybe they'll do it around product category or the product itself. So for example, one of my clients um, uh, in the past have been Sony. I've done a lot of work with them. Uh, they at the very top level break down into Sony Pictures, which covers all the movies and so on. You've got um, Sony uh, Interactive Entertainment, which is essentially sort of PlayStation and uh, uh, and the kind of gaming side. You've then got Sony Music and so on. And then within those, they bring, then break down further. And at various points in their history, they've changed from um, a regional structure where everything's broken down geog uh, geographically and then into functions. And then more recently, they moved to more of a global structure and then it goes into functions and so on. There's pros and cons of all of these. Um, and in some organizations, they'll use projects or matrix structure to try and bridge the gaps so that you don't have these disconnects. However, whatever structure you pick, there will always be teams of people who work mainly together and those that they have less contact with outside of their primary teams. So that's always going to exist. However, no department works in a vacuum. Marketing needs to give leads to sales. Sales needs to hand over purchases, new customers, over to finance to collect payment, and they need to hand over their customers to customer success and support and operations to actually deliver what they've sold. All the teams need to be able to hand issues and feedback to the product development team so that you're continually improving. And the product team need to be able to communicate and updates and, uh, and get feedback from all the other teams. And then of course, HR need to be able to support every single team in their hiring needs and supporting performance management. And then you've got IT and operations who need to understand the needs of the business and, uh, and support them in providing the appropriate capacity and evolving with their, uh, their needs. And then of course, you've got leadership as a, the, team that sits above all this, who need to be able to communicate to all the teams and get updates from everyone on their progress and their obstacles and give them clarity on this stuff and so on. So departments are necessary, but there's also no magic structure that avoids silos or eliminates the need for communication between groups. So we can't completely eliminate the problem altogether, or at least the potential for there to be silos between teams through clever organization structure. And I've worked with so many organizations where they try. They try and come up with a structure that will perfectly address all of this. And I'm yet to see it work. The answer, in my experience, tends to be, it's best to organize functionally. And then if you can then, there are various other ways in which you can then create the, the connections, but anything else uh, causes more problems than it's worth. So given that, given that it makes sense to structure your business, largely by your functions, marketing, sales, HR, etc. How do we then break the silos? How do we avoid certain groups becoming disconnected from others or that they're becoming a duplication of effort uh, and uh, mistakes and drop balls and all these sorts of things? Well, many organizations that I've worked with, uh, I've, that I've, um, uh, and I've seen how they do this, they turn to cross-departmental meetings. So getting a meeting, a group, which brings and pulls together people from across the organization. And whilst these can help, I've often seen them become a big waste of time with large numbers of people being invited to attend and then not feeling like it's that valuable. And so they stop showing up. Now, you can make these more effective by um, combining them with cross departmental objectives. So helping them to focus their effort on achieving concrete outcomes, such as reducing customer complaints or increasing customer lifetime value so that you've got a cross departmental team that actually know why they're there and what they're trying to do. And as a result of bringing their own ideas and uh, responsibilities to how they can solve that problem. So do make sure that you do that. So that's one way of doing it, but it's, it's got problems and it doesn't, it doesn't solve all of the issues. 
Um, another way that can help is having collaborative tools and systems where uh, you've got things like project management tools, customer relationship management, knowledge management, process management systems um, that are shared across the teams that make it easier for those teams to see what's being done elsewhere. And, and that's really, really good. However, it doesn't solve all the silo problem because people will need to actively go and look for that information. So there's no guaranteed result there. You have to hope that someone in uh, one part of the business goes and looks at, oh, what do, how do they work with this customer in this particular way? And do they collect this information or not? So that helps, but it, it doesn't uh, solve the issue. I've found that the best approach to solve silos and break down those uh, within the business and avoid the biggest problems is to look at the specific processes that we're concerned about. For example, the customer journey for how a customer goes through your business touches many parts of the business, marketing, sales, finance, etc. We want to avoid those customers being asked to repeat steps or having an inconsistent or frustrating experience due to silos between teams. That's the, that's the challenge. That's what we want, right? Because when it works well, marketing provides a lead, sales converts them to a customer, finance collects their payment, operations delivers the outcome, customer success and support, collect a happy case study at the end, and all of that works. So if we take that as a particular process, it then becomes easier to solve. And the key to success in, in solving it is really made up of three things. The first is understanding the high level process. Everyone in the organization should receive some basic training on that high level process. For example, when I worked at DHL 20 plus years ago now, um, I uh, used to deliver training to their customer service staff on what we call back then the cycle of a shipment. Now this covered the key steps involved in a parcel being booked for delivery, paid for, picked up, sorted at the sorting office, uh, sent out to the, the various hubs and so on, uh, you know, being flown to a different country, uh, often in the case of DHL, and eventually a van driver uh, delivering, uh, delivering that to a customer. Now, everyone received that training from customer service at the beginning of the process, taking the calls to be booking all the way through, right through to the van drivers who are actually delivering that. Everyone knew the high level steps in the cycle of a shipment, in that, uh, that journey, that process for a parcel uh, in it, uh, and all the steps that involved. Now, that's at a high level, not every single thing. They don't know every single uh, uh, step that's done, but they do know the key pieces of information and the concept that there was this like airway bill number that was and when that was created and how important that was and so on. And that training was part of employee onboarding for all new team members. So that's the first thing that you need is that high level tra uh, training on the process for everyone. The second is then you need well-defined handoffs in the detailed process uh, for the, the, the teams have got. So defining the handoffs between those teams. So we've got the high level training, but then you need the detailed process because a customer service agent doesn't know all the things that they need to do when taking a booking from the customer for the parcel, just because they were told, oh yeah, the first thing you need to do is take a booking. And then you know, it's it, someone picks it up. Like they need to know what are the specific steps, what information needs to be uh, captured, how do they calculate the price, how do they uh, process the order, and all these sorts of things. So they that each per, each team, each function requires their detailed processes of what do they need to do, how are they contributing. But also as part of that, there needs to be the handoff. And the key is that um, uh, that they can do that handoff consistently so that they can um, uh, provide that information to the next uh, step in the process, right? So um, that, and that would normally form part of the detailed guidance. So the customer service team have got their call scripts along with the steps that they need to do a booking in the parcel. Van drivers have got their checklists uh, that um, uh, tell them what they need to do if the person's not in and all these sorts of things. Finance team have got their processes on how do they invoice the customer depending on the contract and agreement that's set with the customer and so on. Everyone knew what they needed to do. And when there's a step in the process for something to be handed over to another team, so for example, when a sale is made and finance need to invoice them and collect payment, the handoff is made clear. Who needs to be sent what? So this might, and this might even specify 
like exactly what information sent or even like a template email or here's a system and here's a link to that system and you fill in this information what information needs to be provided what system needs to be updated who needs to be called on the phone whatever it is um, is all detail because when those handoffs are clear each team either side of the handoff are happy they know what has or hasn't been done so far and as a result they can avoid duplicating effort or um, or dropping balls. And a great example of this that we've all had is when you call a contact center and you know, on the phone and you explain the problem that you've got and they go, ah, yes, I need to hand you over to another team. And what we all hate is they hand you over to the other team and the other person says, so what seems to be the problem? Because there's no handoff. What you need is that person who's doing the handoff for you, they need to communicate, hey, I'm handing this customer over to your team because they've got the following problem. And my understanding is that your team are going to do that. And here's the information I've got and so on. So that you don't have to go through security again, provide a load of ID numbers, provide your, uh, uh, spell out your, your surname and all these sorts of things. They can provide all that information. And when that handoff happens, that's when you get a much better experience for customers and the whole team becomes much more efficient. Now, another example of this um, in terms of particularly that efficiency. So I've got uh, an accountancy um, uh, business who's a, a, a client of ours. I haven't got an accountancy business. I've got a client who's an accountancy business. Um, and they were looking to improve their client onboarding process. So they created the high level training that covers who does what in each stage and then the detailed processes for each team that includes the handovers. Now, once they had that in place, they instantly identified that some teams, like for example, their, their tax team, had misunderstood what steps had been taken earlier in the process and so were duplicating work. So, for example, asking for the clients, uh, their clients VAT information that the client had already provided numerous steps earlier. Um, and of course, there were various other things that they were either being asked for or um, or not being asked for that then became a problem later. And so by having all of that detail out, they were able to fix that and clients got a better experience and the business was made more efficient as a result. So that's really, really nice. So that's the second thing is that detail of the handoffs, the clarity on how those handoffs should work uh, and making sure that you've got ownership of those handoffs so that there's um, someone responsible for making sure it's done in an effective way. The third thing you need is feedback loops to make sure that you can continuously improve your ways of working. Because as good as the training and the processes are, there will always be some exceptions and some mistakes. Your team will need a way that they can raise these issues so that other teams in the process become aware and can make changes to their ways of working to fix these. For example, if your finance team regularly find that the sales team forget to include the customer's address details, that can cause a lot of delays and extra work, right? So it might mean that as a result, you have to reach out to the customer and get it, or the finance team have to go and find that customer's contact details. But then if they're not sure which company it is, and is it, was it this office or was it headquarters, they then have to contact sales. And then you've got a lot of back and forth and that takes a lot of effort. What you want is the ability for that to get raised as an issue to, to address. And in my businesses, we use uh, an issues list, which allows anyone to raise an issue for the relevant team uh, to then review and address as part of their regular team meeting. So if you say, for example, in that, in that example with finance, finance would say, yeah, this is causing us a problem. They'd raise an issue. They'd raise the issue for sales. Sales in their weekly meeting would then see that issue and say, oh yeah, we're not consistently connect, collecting customer details and on addresses. We can see the impact that this has on finance. As a result, we're going to update our process to make sure that we don't uh, miss that in future. And as a result, you completely remove an issue that causes a load of waste and inefficiency and pain for customers uh, at a stroke, right? So that's what we need in place. But I've sometimes been asked, how should you organize all of this? How do you organize the training, the processes, the guidance and the issues? Because it can become a mess if you don't structure it in some way. And I've seen this done in many different ways. And in fact, uh, one of our clients initially felt that they should organize it by process. So for example, having a folder for the customer journey, the all the customer journey processes go in. And there's there's some logic to that and it's a really nice idea because the it's designed to create some cross department visibility and reduce the silos right you've got one customer folder for the customer journey uh, sorry one folder for the customer journey and all the departments go in there and that's it 
However, my experience is that has got a few problems. And the main problem is a lack of ownership. There's not a single team or person who owns the process end to end in that level of detail, yet it's a huge process involving nearly everyone in the business. So it becomes very hard to make updates, keep it in good shape, or know when to use it. And also the handoffs become not clear between teams because the whole thing is one process. And so um, the client that uh, had proposed this and was keen to do it um, when they started to try and implement it, found it unraveled pretty quickly. What we've found instead as the best way is to organize the guidance within your functions, marketing, sales, HR, finance, etc. because this makes it clear who owns what. Now within those, so if you create, imagine you've got your folder for marketing, you've got your folder for sales and so on. Within those, you can then break into process areas. So marketing might have subfolders for running a campaign and finance might have uh, folders for paying invoices, often known as accounts payable in their case, you might have one for send, um, essentially collecting uh, money in, which often known as accounts receivable, which is essentially when you get an order from a customer right the way through to getting the money. Um, what back in when I was a consultant creating processes for finance departments, what we used to call uh, the um, uh, order to pay or order to cash uh, process. So within the function, you might then have the structure of these processes, um, but not trying to do that across the whole organization. And when you do that, um, that makes it a lot easier uh, to, to, to break it down and have ownership for those areas. Now you can still have the training of the end to end process, like the customer journey, um, available, but that can be separate. Um, and, and it's very high level and that's the key. So, um, what, what we'd recommend is that if you've got resources such as that, such as, you know, um, all employee onboarding, you know, things that apply to everyone, sick policies, etc., um, put that in a, folder called like all company or all employee and make a specific person responsible for it. Now, it might be perhaps someone, perhaps HR, or it might be operations, or it might be a COO, but having one area that's for a, a relatively small number of, a small amount of documentation that covers everyone is really powerful and you can keep that high level. So you see how you've got your high level training is all company. And then you've got your detailed processes, which are managed in the functions. You don't want all the detailed processes for every single function to be all company. It becomes too much. No single person can get their head around all of it. Instead, you want it, you can break it down to those functions. And when you've got the handoffs, it works really well, right? When at the top level, you've got the customer, the sales process, the customer conversion journey of saying, Here's how we get leads. Here's how we convert them. Here's how they work with us. That's great. That's the training. But then within marketing, they've got all the detail of exactly how do we get those leads, which ads, how do we come up with the right copy, all those sorts of things. They can manage that detail. And so that's how you can, um, you can manage those splits. Um, and at Air Manual, we have uh, an example workspace where you can see, um, this in action, like how to organize it in a sensible way. Uh, you can reach out to, uh, our team support at airmanual.co. Uh, check us an email if you'd like to to see uh, that in in practice and what that looks like. So there you go. That's how to break team silos, including training uh, on your key processes as part of your onboard um, uh, employee onboarding. So uh, that's uh, step one. Um, then making sure that your uh, handoffs between your teams are really clear, and then making sure that teams can raise and solve issues when things go wrong. When you do that. Uh, and uh, implement that in your business, you'll find that you re massively reduce the silos and certainly the impact to the customers and the uh, um, causes of inefficiency. Now, when you are looking to start to apply this in your business, don't do everything all at once. Instead, pick one process that touches multiple departments and start to apply these principles in one of those departments. So look at the high level journey and then say, OK, now start, let's say, at the beginning, let's start with what happens in marketing, what happens in sales, ideally, wherever you're ha currently having the biggest problems. Then once you start making those changes, monitor the results, gather feedback. And as you see improvements, you can gradually expand this approach to other functions and then other processes across your business. The key is to remember that the journey to a stress free business and applying these sorts of things it's a marathon, not a sprint. But by taking these steps repeatedly, you can transform those potential silos into effective collaborative units that work seamlessly together. 
ensuring a smoother operation and a much less stressful work environment. Uh, and of course, please do reach out to me and my team by email. Uh, the best way to reach the team is support at airmanual.co, uh, but you can address direct questions to me at lexis.kingsbury at airmanual.co. If you've got any questions or would like um, uh, to get some advice or some help, uh, just reach out. Also, if you'd like to see some examples of how to provide training and processes for your team in a way that actually get used, uh, we've got a great guide on this. Uh, you can check that out at airmanual.link forward slash discover. It's got loads of great examples and templates that you can see. Uh, and finally, if you found the content today super valuable, please take a minute, leave a five star review, share it on social media, tag me in. Uh, this will help the podcast to get more visibility and ultimately help more people. Otherwise, until next time, have fun.